So greetings to you all. Greetings from my basement where I'm hiding out from the heat. And, uh, but our plants, of course, don't have that luxury of being anywhere cool. So I do want to talk to, uh, to you about a subject that may be unfamiliar to you in terms of being great gardeners or even balcony gardeners. So that what I want to talk to you about today is many plants that you might not have considered in your gardens, and that's, of course, native plants. So why would one garden with native plants? Well, that's a good question. In a time where we and our often specialized and sometimes fussy cultivated plants struggle with water needs, with extreme sun exposure, we might consider plants that are far more adapted to the local environment. The native plants have seen it all before, maybe not the extremes that we're having right now, but they've certainly seen a lot and they've thrived. They're much more adapted to the local pests and diseases. And importantly, they foster a whole range of local and specialized bees and other pollinators that need all the help they can get. And very importantly, they're not invasive or mostly not invasive. And as Kendra has already mentioned, the next seminar in this series will be on invasive plants. And it kind of goes hand in hand with gardening with native plants. Because when I say gardening with native plants, that doesn't mean that your whole garden needs to go native, but you might consider using some native plants where there is an appropriate niche in your garden. The photo that you're seeing here was taken last spring in my friend Caroline's garden here in Nanaimo, and she specializes in native plants. And I'll show you some more photos from her garden and share with you what I've learned from her. What you see in this particular picture here is a wealth of sea blush, some native camas, both in bloom and already spent, some lovely Menzies larkspur here, the blue, um, some bleeding heart, and then them blue flower, small flower blue eyed Marys. So that's just a small crop of what she has in her garden. So with that, I just want to touch on a bit of business um, and then we'll go into the actual gardening. So I am, as Kendra already said, Dorothy Kieser. I'm a certified master gardener with the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. And we do these seminars in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library at the Harbor Front Branch. What I really want you to know though, is that the information in this seminar is as science-based and as accurate as I could possibly make it. And also important is that the use of the information in this seminar is at your sole discretion, responsibility, and liability if you want to use any of it. That was the business portion. Now to get really into the uh, gardening. The first thing in any garden planning is what are you trying to accomplish? What is your aim? Is your aim mostly just to have a beautiful flower garden, the aesthetics of it? Do you want to specifically um, help the pollinators have a pollinator garden? Do you have a need for erosion control? Or do you want to grow a hedgerow for fostering birds and bees and whatnot and a windbreak? All these things you have to consider before you even put a shovel in the ground or start making a plant list of what you would like to see. Uh, in terms of the pollinators, and I won't go into any details because I'm not a bee person, but I just wanted to say that uh, BC has an incredible wealth of native bees, 400 plus native bees, some of which are generalists and some of them are very specialized. And so the great range of flower shapes and colors and blooming times from early, very early to very late are very important um, features to fostering those insects. And in your reading list, you'll see that you have um, a reference to the Victoria Habitat Acquisition Trust because, uh, because they have an excellent list of recommended native pollinator plants. So any of you who are interested in that particular aspect of gardening, I uh, strongly suggest you have a look at their list. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I'll go through a fair number of plants and I certainly wouldn't be able to remember all the details of who is a generalist and who likes what type of environment. And so again, in your reading list, there's a book by the two authors, Pojar and McKinnon, that uh, is an excellent resource for native plants. Um, they come at it from the uh, angle of recognition of native plants, but they also tell you, do they like moist? Do they like dry or sunny? Um, all these kind of things that you want to consider before you plant anything. Now, when you look at this slide, of course, um, it's certainly not a native plant. It's a dandelion. Dandelions were imported centuries ago, but it's such an excellent pollinator plant that I can accept them, if not in my garden garden, at least in my environment, because they give me the hint as to when I should put the uh, my mason bees out, my pupae from the mason bees out so that uh, they can hatch and pollinate my fruit trees. With that, let's see what we need to uh, do in terms of uh, getting you started. Plants have very special needs, just like people have very special needs. And so the first thing in your planning is that you actually evaluate your site characteristic. What does your garden have to offer the plant? Because it'll only plants will only thrive if they're given conditions under which they can do well. Some of them might hang in there for a long time, but the right conditions, the right plant for the right condition is very important. So what have you got to offer? Do you have a shady lot? Lots and lots of plants are very happy in shade or dappled shade. Other plants like full baking sun, some uh, plants need it quite wet. Other plants can thrive and do better in dry. So all these things you need to consider. You also need to consider, do you have sandy soil? Do you have a clay type soil? So first thing you go out into your garden and you look what conditions you have to offer the plants. And then you go on and make your plant list, your wish list for what you would actually like to do. So um, as I go through my, through my talk, um, bit by bit, you'll see that I'll describe plants in four different habitat types. Woodland, um, meadow types that are some are moist in the spring and dry in the summer, full sun and dry, and then some out and out wetland so that you get an impression of what all is out there and then make some choices. But while I'm at the choices that I'm going to present to you, I want to say um, I'm personally so intrigued by the native flora that it was awfully difficult for me to limit myself to a reasonable number of um, plants that I'm going to describe to you because there's way more plants out there that would be perfectly suitable for gardens than I have space or time for here. But uh, I'll present you a few things and then we'll go from there. Here is my friend Caroline's garden in one of the very first years. You can see the environment she has to offer is full baking sun. Um, and at this point in the development of her garden, there isn't a whole lot there yet. There's still a fair bit of bare earth. You see some of the Oregon grape. You see some flowering red currants. And there's a few ground covers that I can't determine on this picture but it's a, it's a work in progress. And any garden, and especially a garden with native plants, where the plants are oftentimes, when they come out of nurseries, I'll talk that, about that in a minute, are, are not yet so adjusted to the garden environment. It takes patience and learning, and you are thrilled with the successes and slightly less thrilled with the failures, but give it a go, and, uh, and there's many, many rewards. So that's Caroline's garden early on. A couple of years later, it looks really quite different. Um, she still has some cultivated plants here in the irises that you see in the background, but you can see the ground is far more covered. And uh, just to describe the plants here, here's a beautiful Menzies larkspur. You see some of the sea blush again, and you get a closer look at the small flower blue-eyed Marys. You can see that the Mahonia, the Oregon grape, has grown quite a bit. 
so it's a it's a lovely garden in progress and each time that i go by new things are in there but also it's different seasons and different times so i see different plants that do particularly well in her particular setting now, in terms of getting started, um, you want to know what soil type you have. I already mentioned that earlier, but you also want to cover the soil. I think one of the key features in a lot of gardens is to have the proper mulch. And from what Caroline tells me, she particularly likes these little platelet wood chips that uh, in the Nanaimo area, Milner, um, not Milner Gardens, but the, the Milner people who do soils and mulch and whatnot have to offer. Um, they act a little bit like a shingle roof in the sense they keep the moisture in the ground. And Caroline has shown me that it also really fosters the mycorrhizae that are in the root system of plants. And they do particularly well in that kind of layered approach of the mulch and keeping things nice and moist. I can't tell you too much more about the actual background of soils and so on, because each of your garden is uh, different and the conditions are different. So you have to do a little bit of trial and error for yourself. But now I want to get into the source of plants. And the very first thing I want to say is don't ever dig out plants from the native environment. It disturbs the native environment, so it's really not an ethical thing to do. And chances are not only do you just disturb the surrounding plants and remove valuable plants that may be rare, um, your chances of success of actually transferring those plants to a suitable environment in your garden are limited. I particularly think just as an example of trillium, trillium have endlessly deep roots. And for you to try and dig that out and have a thriving plant to go into your garden is almost hopeless. So here's some suggestions in terms of nurseries that really specialize in native plants. So one of my favorite ones is the Sanif Try that again, Saanich Native Plant Nursery, obviously in Saanich. Not only do they have a fantastic selection, but they also have a fantastic website that you can look stuff up in to see um, what kind of conditions they like and what they have and so on. So go, I, it's in your reference list. So go to the website of the Saanich Native Plant Nursery and you can learn all kinds of things. On Salt Spring, uh, Thimble Farms has a good stock of native plants, so that's well worth checking out. I'll go skip the next one. Uh, Streamside Native Plants in Bowser has a lot of native plants, obviously. The Gary Oak Recovery Team website gives you all kinds of hints. And the Natural Abundance Native Plant Nursery in Nanaimo is kind of unique in terms of it does rescue plants. And when I say rescue plants, what the folks from the NALT group do is when there's a new piece of woodland to be developed or a new road to go through, they'll go in and try and collect as much of the native plants as they possibly can, nurse them in their nursery, and then if they're thriving, then they will sell them. I've gotten a lot of lovely native plants from there, also various native trees and so on. So it's well worth, if you're in the Nanaimo area, to check out the uh, native plant nursery that rescues those plants. But don't ever think you can dig out your own. It, that just is not ethical and not likely to work. What you can do is you could collect seeds and there's a number of plants that make very suitable seeds, but starting plants from seed is a very specialized science all onto itself because a lot of plants need, or seeds need layering or stratification, which means they have to have a certain number of freeze thaw cycles, the temperature has to be just so, the moisture has to be just so. I started some camas seeds uh, some number of years ago. I had bought some camas seeds and I actually did nurse them through the first leaf stage, but it took two years to do that. And, uh, and then I outplanted them and I still only got one or two out of the whole package of seeds. Right now I'm trying the same with some of the fawn lilies 
and keep all your fingers crossed so maybe that I'll have some success and get some plants in a couple of years time. So that was my little spiel on plant sources. And now I want to move on to the actual habitat types. And I'm going to start with woodland. This picture is taken in my own woodland. And so I'll go through a goodly number of plants that are very suitable, not necessarily only for woodland, but for shady, coolish spots with oftentimes a bit of moisture, but not necessarily moisture. So I'll go through various plants and, uh, and then move on to the next habitat type. Um, also, if you have a shady spot, as I said earlier, you don't have to only deal with native plants. For instance, this woodland would be a perfectly suitable habitat type to put in some cultivated plants like rhododendrons, for instance, and another stretch of my woodland, I actually did put in quite a few little rhododendrons and they're coming along very nicely and they're coming along better than the rhodos that are in the in the full heat of, uh, of my place. So definitely a combination of cultivated and, and native plants is a wonderful way to go. So let's look at some of the plants that would do well under that uh, type of condition. And the first ones I want to look at is with you are the two Oregon grapes. In fact, it's only the dull Oregon grape, the Mahonia, Mahonia nervosa, that um, is a particular woodland plant. But as you noticed in Caroline's garden, and this picture here is taken out of Caroline's garden, it's a fair generalist. So it can do well in a setting like the woodland here where it makes a wonderful ground cover. You see all these <clears throat> Mahonias through, all throughout here, or you can have it in a fairly sunny spot as, as I shown you in Caroline's garden. It's a lovely plant in terms of an early, early spring bloomer. It's fragrant. It has a beautiful yellow blossom, shiny foliage. Gets to be, oh, anywhere from 30 centimeters to a meter high, depending on conditions. And then in the fall or later summer, actually right about now, it has these very attractive blue berries that are liked by birds but they also make a nice jelly if you were so inclined that goes well with any savory dishes. The close cousin to the dull Oregon grape um, is the tall Oregon grape. Um, it thrives in a much drier environment. It'll do at the edge of a shady area, but it thrives in this much sunnier environment um, and gets much taller. It gets up easily up to two meters high but it has the same type of flowers, also fragrant, it's very similar foliage, just a little more shiny, um, and the same type of bluish berries. Moving on to one of my favorite shrubs, and that's the Salal. Um, and it, in many countries, including here, is also a well-recognized uh, cultivated shrub um, because it has such marvelous foliage. Here you see the previous year's foliage and the new foliage is nice and shiny green and and light in the spring it has these pinky white bell-shaped flowers and of course the wonderful berries in the fall so you can see that from a um, pollinator attractor the flowers are lovely and in the fall the or late summer the berries are absolutely marvelous for birds and other wildlife to eat and it i may have already said it that it's absolutely excellent for long lasting bouquets most of you have had um, commercial bouquets and almost invariably there's some salal in it because it just lasts and lasts so it's an excellent addition to the garden um, with pruning you can keep it in a very manageable low size and especially if it's in a sunny environment it stays fairly low at under a meter in the first place but if you give it some shade and uh, and moisture like on the west coast it can easily get up to three meters so it's your choice as to what you offer it because it's a fair generalist 
Another plant that thrives in both woodland and in the sun is the red huckleberry or a vaccinium parvifolium. And it's also a marvelous multi-season plant. I'm always for planting multi-season plants wherever possible. Here you see um, a bit of huckleberry before the leaves actually come out. If you look really carefully, here's the leaf just emerging from the leaf sheath, but the leaf sheath are so attractive on their own in that sort of purpley white um, color and delicacy. So it's something that you can have early, early in the spring in your garden and enjoy it. Later on, it has flowers similar to um, the salal that we just saw. And then at this time of the year, of course, it has the marvelous berries. Berries good for jam and jelly for us, but also excellent for wildlife. I already said it's a bit of a generalist. Here it is in a, in a woodland setting with a bit of dappled shade, but even in the full shade. But it also does extremely well in the full sun. This picture I took in a fully exposed sun and you can see how well the shrub is doing. Um, height wise, it's kind of up to you because you can prune it. Um, but in nature, if it's shady, it can grow up to several meters high. Um, if it's sunny, it stays at about a meter, meter and a half. Now moving from shrubs to understory plants. And the first one I want to look at because I'm so fond of it is, are the fawn lilies. Um, we have two types of fawn lilies here. The one is the white fawn lily or Erythronium oregonum and the pinky purple fawn lily Erythronium revolutum. The purple one here that I'm pointing out is in my own garden. The other one is in a park in Nanaimo and you can see how it makes whole drifts of flowers so delicate. Here's a close up of one of them. And even when it isn't flowering, it has these very attractive leaves that are sort of leopardy colored. Um, it comes out early, early in the spring, March, early April. Um, and um, and the leaves come out first, so you can recognize where the fawn lilies are going to grow. Then the flowers come out, and then over the summer, they first form the seeds, and then they die back, only to come back in the following year if the conditions are right. You can very easily collect seed from them, as I mentioned earlier, but whether the seeds, whether you can make, so to speak, make new plants out of those seeds, or whether you have to get it from a nursery, is another question. It's certainly worth a try if you get the seeds from your own garden or from some place where they don't deplete nature because after all, you don't want to take away from nature at all. Another plant that's a very suitable garden plant is the bleeding heart or Dicentra formosa. Excellent pollinator. It's full of nectar, full of uh, pollen. And so the bumblebees crawl in there and have a marvelous time. Very, very unique flower shape, as you can see here, and attractive foliage. This makes an excellent understory to shrubs like rhododendrons, for instance. Makes this nice uh, drift. Um, of first the leaves and then the flowers, which are really quite long lasting. And it does well in dry and moist conditions. It's more luxurious in moist conditions, but it does like the shade. So it won't do well in the full sun, but it's, it's very lovely. The other um, attractive thing in terms of uh, gardener is that it's definitely deer resistant. And I don't know if, if, if the deer recognize that it can cause some skin irritation. Certainly for the gardener, you need to be a little bit careful because some people find that it can cause some skin irritation. But, um, but certainly it's a lovely plant to have in the garden. With a bit of caution, it can kind of run away. You can sort of see what a large area it covers here. And if you're not careful in your garden, the same thing can happen in your garden and you don't necessarily just want a uh, bleeding heart. So you have to keep it a little bit contained. Here's a wonderful woodland plant, but that takes a reasonable amount of sun as well. And that's the Trillium ovatum. I already mentioned, don't dig that out. It has a root that goes on forever and ever. But it's such a wonderful 
plant, when it first comes out, you just see the attractive leaves in threes. Um, and then the flower comes out white and with these golden pistils uh, and anthers here in the middle. And then as the plant ages, it turns this beautiful purpley color. I always find it amazing that it goes from white to colored because so many of our cultivated plants, when the flowers first come out, they're a brilliant, whatever color they might be, yellow, red, or what have you. And as the sun hits them, they fade and the trillium goes in the opposite direction. It goes from this brilliant white to a very beautiful purple color. It, they, um, depending on conditions, they get anywhere from 20 to 50 centimeters high and it's just a joy to behold in your garden. Another great understory plant is the vanilla leaf. As you can see here, it again forms a beautiful carpet, although it's, it's a somewhat higher plant than a carpet, anywhere from 30 centimeters to, uh, to a meter high. I've never seen it at a meter high, but the books describe it that way. 30 centimeters is about the height that I've seen around here forming this lovely carpet of green uh, first thing in the spring. So the leaves come up early in the season because the plant totally dies back to its uh, underground stems. And then early in the season, the leaves come up and then in around May, June, the white flowers come up. And then if you're lucky, you can actually get a little bit of fall color, getting this uh, light purple color. It doesn't always do it. And certainly this summer, it, uh, the leaves have dried out before you get the purple color, but sometimes you get a bit of fall color. Now, why is it called vanilla leaf? Because when you walk through a patch like that, I certainly don't smell any vanilla, but it makes an excellent addition to a dried bouquet because the, it, they stay green for goodly length of time. And as they dry, they put forth a wonderful vanilla scent. So very attractive to have in a dried bouquet. And if um, the urban myth has anything to do with it, it's very good to chase away spiders out of your house. I haven't noticed it chasing many spiders out of my house and spiders are quite happy with me. A plant that I failed to be able to grow, much to my regret, but that does extremely well in my friend Chris's garden, and this is where the pictures were taken, is the wild ginger. It's a very low carpeting type of plant with these shiny heart-shaped leaves that stay around um, for most of the season. And, uh, and so if you give it the right conditions, but I've never managed that, it likes moist and shady. Um, then it will form a marvelous carpet. So in my friend Chris's garden, it forms a wonderful understory under her multitude of rhododendrons. And not only is it very attractive in terms of the green carpeting, it has these most miraculous looking flowers that hide in the foliage. You can see one hiding here, um, but here's a bit of a close up. And they have these long extensions, almost like an elephant's trunk that originate from each one of the petals. So very, very attractive plant if you can manage to get it to grow, if you give it the right conditions. A much easier plant to grow is the twin flower, Linnea borealis, and it's a fair generalist. I took this picture in my friend Caroline's garden, and as I've already told you, Caroline's garden is a very sunny garden, and it's just growing very well in the bit of shade under some of her bushes. So it forms this lovely green carpet, stays green all year long and, and really is carpet like it only gets to be a couple of the carpet only gets to be a couple of centimeters high and then these little pinky flowers each stem it's a little hard to see but each stem uh, makes two flowers and hence the name twin flower um, they they look so delicate and they're beautifully fragrant so something well worth having in your garden, provided you can give it a bit of shade, but otherwise it's not particularly fussy and makes this lovely understory carpet. So well worth considering. And what would a shade garden be without ferns? Here are native fern, uh, 
polystichum munitum, which is a sword fern. It makes a great cover in a woodland garden. It's excellent under plants like rhododendrons where it can give, get some shade. Uh, it's great under difficult to uh, grow uh, conditions like cedar trees, for instance, it'll do well or under big firs. So if you have a condition where where you have mostly woodland and you, not a whole lot of anything else grows, you'd be likely to be very successful with a sword fern. So that's a, a good option for for a shade shade area. Um, less more fussy, I should say, is the maidenhair fern. It's a very delicate, more low growing fern, but it needs a fair bit of air moisture. It doesn't need much in the way of soil, as you can see here, but it does need that moisture. So if you can give it a spot close to a little bit of, a, of running water where there's a fair bit of uh, moisture in the air, then it's a beautiful thing to have. And that's why in the natural environment, you see it so much along waterfalls and uh, places like that where it's absolutely luxurious. This fern here, I can't even tell you the name, but I liked it so much that I wished I had it in my garden. So ferns of all kinds, and particularly our native sword fern, or in the right condition, the maidenhair fern, are great in a shady spot and, and with a bit of moisture, but not a whole lot of moisture for the sword, sword fern. And one more ground cover that I want to talk about and that is the kinnikinnik or bearberry. Again, it makes a wonderful carpet and it's a real generalist. Um, uh, in this left-hand picture here where you see the bell-shaped flowers, um, I took that in the full sun. And uh, as you can see, it's doing very well with its new growth it, and the shiny leaves. And the whole thing makes a carpet that's only about, oh, maximum 20 centimeters high, if it's even that. So it's a, it's a great plant to have in, in a fair sunny spot, but it also does very well in the shade. This picture was taken in the full shade later in the season. As you can see, here's the flowers, here's the berries, which uh, are very much liked by various animals. And again, it does very well. You see there's new growth, there's the old shiny growth. It's a dense understory. So if where you want to have a, a real good ground cover in your garden, that's certainly a con the plant that you might consider. Moving on to the meadow end of things. Um, this is taken in a natural meadow. And as you can see that at least parts of the year, it must be fairly moist, otherwise the moss wouldn't grow. But all these plants are annuals. So they grow up in the spring, they're absolutely glorious. Then they form seed, the seed falls into the ground and you can have the same wonderful look again next spring. Um, because as you can see with the, all the rocks around here, chances are when the spring ra rains are done with and when the earth dries up, um, there isn't going to be very much of the way of flowers left. So what we see here are all plants that you can have in your garden. There's the spring gold, wonderful graceful leaves and yellow flowers. There's the field chickweed, um, which does very well under those conditions. And again, the sea blush that was I also showed you in Caroline's garden. So a very lovely collection of plants, but you can also see that uh, you have some Mahonia there that's a generalist. And so um, it's a lovely thing to have if you give it some, some moisture in the spring and then you can have the glory each spring from the seeds. Let's see what uh, grows in that type of environment. And one of the plants that grows at the edge of this environment is the local dogwood that you'll all recognize because it's the provincial flower. Um, here you see the close up of a flower. Actually, the actual flowers are in this little clusters here. This is just the sort of bee attractant, as you will. Or looking at the whole tree, you can see it flowering here at the edge of a meadow and the, the forest behind. Um, these, as you probably all know, form trees anywhere from four to 12 meters tall. You get these flowers, very attractive to 
bees and butterflies and beetles. Um, you get those in about April. And then if you're lucky, you might actually even get a second flush, slightly fewer blooms, but nonetheless uh, in the later summer. And um, then you get red berries forming in this cluster of flowers. So definitely an attractive garden plant. There's all kinds of cultivated varieties, but I think our native variety is as good as any that we can get and certainly thrives here. Very closely related to the uh, native dogwood is the red osier dogwood, which as I always like uh, plants that have multi-season attractant attraction. Um, you can see here in the winter, you get these beautiful red stems, which are wonderful in winter bouquets, and they stay nice and red. And later, of course, as the foliage develops, you don't see them anymore, but, uh, but it's attractive in the winter. It, the red osier dogwood forms a smallish tree, maximum about, oh, five to six meters tall. And in the spring, you get these beautiful white blossoms and nice foliage year round. Again, it's very good for bees and beetles and butterflies and that sort of thing. Um, they do make berries, but they're not very spectacular, but I'm sure some wildlife eats them. And if you have them in the right condition, they'd like a fair bit of moisture. If you have them in the right condition, they actually form a bit of fall foliage, uh, fall color, I should say. And here's a plant that, uh, sorry, that doesn't particularly fit into the meadow plants, but because it is another cornice, I just wanted to put it in because it does make a good garden plant, but more in a shady woodland, and that's the bunchberry with the typical dogwood type white flowers that. Well, they're not actually the flower, the actual flowers are in here, but um, that then form the red berries in the fall. And of course, most of you will know bunchberry and know that it only grows oh, anywhere from five to 20 centimeters tall, but they do need moisture, moisture and they do need a fair bit of shade. So I just want to put them in here because after all, I was talking about the various cornices. But one thing that does do well at the edge of a moisture or even as a specimen tree is the Arbutus, Arbutus menziesii. It has such wonderful bark um, that peels right about now and it, the under, under bark or the new bark, I should say, is anywhere from this attractive beige to an almost pistachio color and so very attractive for its bark lovely in terms of the, the white flowers that are early in the spring. And then, and those are very attractive to various bees and whatnot. And then in the fall, it will have red berries, which especially the robins like. The drawback of this year, as far as the Arbutus is concerned, is that um, they've been so stressed by all the drought that we've had that that caused the fungus disease to be particularly prevalent this spring. And so we had a lot of leaf loss, but the tree, this tree for instance, has made up for it and put out a second flush of foliage. And I hope that next year, it won't be quite so bad as far as the fungus disease, fungus disease is concerned. They can take tremendous amount of drought. And the only drawback in terms of Arbutuses is that A, they get very big and B, they lose leaves in the summer. And so if you're a diligent, fussy gardener who can't stand to have any leaves on the ground, then Arbutus are a bit of a drawback because they shed their leaves in the summer and you'd have to do raking all summer long. But if you're not too fussy, it's an absolutely wonderful tree to have. In terms of shrubs, one of the things you might really consider is the ocean spray. And it's a true generalist. It will thrive in the full sun on very dry conditions. It will thrive in the forest in moist conditions. So whatever you can have to offer, the ocean spray is a marvelous plant. Um, it can be sheared back so that it keeps fitting your space and uh, it, it has these wonderful white flowers fairly early in the spring. They're actually fragrant and uh, 
attractive to pollinators. The drawback of that particular bush is that these flowers hang on and hang on and hang on even into the next season. And, um, and so if you're fussy, you could prune those off, but I find that trouble. So I will just let them be because it is such a glorious shrub at the right time of the year. Now let's go to the actual understory plants. And most of you will be familiar with the camases. There's various camases in the nursery trade and our native one is the Camassia quamush um, that lends itself very well to gardening native plants as you saw in Caroline's garden. Here, a little bit of a close up of this lovely plant and then a whole meadow um, if you can give it that type of environment. It likes it somewhat moist, but it doesn't have to be terribly moist. In fact, this is a, a meadow that sits straight on rock, so it doesn't hold much moisture for the rest of the season. Um, and of course, camas were an important food source in our native community, but one of the real problems was that there is a plant called the death camas, which has foliage. When you look at it, the foliage here, very, very similar to the edible camas. And as you can see on this picture, they grow cheek by jowl. So um, you really had to know if you were going to be harvesting camas bulbs because they grow from bulbs, um, whether you were dealing with an area that had death camas in it or just the regular camas. There's also a white true camas, which is not poisonous, but you can see there's a difference in terms of the flower shape between the death camas and the true camas. Um, but in terms of the foliage, if you just see foliage or you see the bulbs, then it's very difficult to distinguish. But since we're in the gardening end of things and not in the eating end of things, to us, either one would be a a beautiful garden plant. Oops, I want next, there we go. The next plant I want to talk about is the chocolate lily, which blooms somewhere between March and April and is so graceful with his um, checkerboard pattern and its typical lily look. It does very well in meadows and grassland, it likes full sun, but it'll tolerate shade and is easily propagated through a bulb or even through, through seed. So another nice feature, both of camas and the chocolate lily is that both of them are deer and rabbit resistant. And uh, certainly both deer and rabbit love it in my garden and I don't mind them so long as they don't eat my particular crops. But I do like to have plants that are resistant and that I can enjoy. We've already talked quite a bit about the sea blush or Plectretus congesta, and it's a, a multi-purpose plant in terms of it grows in the sun, it grows in the shade, it uh, can grow on near rock and on grassy bluffs near the ocean. It can be short like this one of about 10 centimeters tall. I've seen it as tall as half a meter. And you don't have to fuss with it because it comes up in the spring, it blooms, it sheds its seeds, and then it'll be there again in profusion, assuming we give it the right condition, in profusion in the next season. Um, now I better move along because we still have quite a bit to do here. And the next habitat is um, the very dry and sunny habitat. And of course, grasses are absolutely ideal in that. But I also want to show you some um, shrubs and some, some of the other plants that are listed here. And the first one I want to talk about, because it's such a beautiful garden plant, is the Saskatoon. It's a small shrub, or it's a shrub or small tree, whichever you want to look at it. And it does very well in dry conditions, rocky conditions. In the early spring, um, around about, oh, April or even, yeah, April-ish, um, it has this profusion of white flowers that are beautiful and beloved by various pollinators. And 
these blueberries are make the best pies. Saskatoon pies is not to be beaten. It's just absolutely wonderful. Um, and so as you can see, if you have a profusion of white flowers like that, you're likely to have a profusion of berries. So well worthwhile to consider in your garden. I chose this particular picture because it's such a beautiful combination with the thimble berries, which I'll talk about in a minute. But then certainly the Saskatoon is a, is a great um, generalist to have. As I say, it does very well in this harsh environment of dry and sunny, but it's also perfectly okay if it's a little moister and shadier. Um, in the shrub category, who can beat the red flowering currant or the gooseberry, but particularly the red flowering currant, which is so prolific and it's such a generalist. You can find it on the driest, rockiest, harshest, sunniest slopes and bloom in profusion and the hummingbirds just go crazy over it. Or as you can see in this particular picture, it also does fairly well in a woodland because you can see the Salal and the um, Douglas fir in the background. And the, either one, it blooms profusely and uh, is suitable for all these habitats. In, early, early spring. So when the hummingbirds first come, it's just great to see them feeding there. And of course, the bees are busy with it as well. And then in the fall, it'll have just like the commercial currants or the cultivated currants, it will have um, berries just like that. Not so good for jam. I find them way too tart, but nonetheless, um, they do make the berries that can again be eaten by the birds. The gooseberry um, is beautiful, beautiful flower, much less common than the red flower and currant, but well worth having. The red flower and currant, can, you can prune it, and if it's in a sunny spot, it will not get any bigger than about a meter, meter and a half, while the gooseberry, no matter where you put it, will never get beyond a meter max but a very beautiful thing to have in a shadier garden, while the, the red flowering currant, as I said, is more of a generalist. Another thing that does extremely well under these trying circumstances of full-on sun is the pearly everlasting, which actually belongs into the general category of the asters. I find that hard to see why, but there we are. It is extremely dry, tolerant and uh, as this lovely perennial herb it spreads from rhizomes so you get big clusters if you let get that big and it's um, medium tall anywhere from 30 to 90 centimeters and um, it can tolerate light shade but one of the really attractive things of it is that it's excellent in dried flower bouquets. So if you want to have some dried flowers for the winter, then grow some of the pearly everlasting because it's great to have those in a bouquet. Um, another one that likes these hard circumstances, actually there's a whole group of them uh, of the stone crops that grow in BC, some taller and some um, very ground hugging. As you can see, this one is maybe five centimeters tall, but look at the environment that it grows in, pure gravel, and yet it's quite attractive in its red um, fleshy foliage. Here's a different type of sedum, again native, but it's a little taller. So a wonderful thing to have in a very sunny um, alpine garden. And again, they're deer and rabbit resistant. So if you have a bit of an alpine stretch or an area close to a driveway that's incredibly dry, a stone crop is a good consideration. And as I say, there's several of them. There's an unusual plant um, that I only discovered this spring, but it's actually cultivated and known from British garden catalogs, and that's the harvest brodicea. It blooms in June. Um, it's a member of the lily family, and it does extremely well in dry and exposed areas. So if you have an alpine area or a particularly dry exposed area, then that's very suitable. It grows up to about, oh, 10, 12 centimeters, in the spring, it, the first thing that comes out are the leaves. And you can see here that you just get these tendrils of stems and no more leaves are visible. So leaves come out first, then you get these beautiful 
about two centimeter across lily like flowers of the harvest brodisia. They come from corms, so are relatively easy to um, have in the nursery trade. And again, the corms were used as a food source by the local communities. Actually, there's a journal entry from Alexander Menzies when he was on the voyage with Captain Vancouver in 1792, describing how the natives uh, harvested those harvest prodigia. And the last habitat I want to go into is the wetland. And not many of you will have wetland, but there's a fair number of generalists uh, amongst that particular group. And the, the, a lot of the ones that I'm going to describe are actually excellent if you want to stabilize a bank or have a bit of a um, more wild garden um, where you just have bigger shrubs and uh, some little trees. And the first one I want to talk about is the Pacific crab apple or Malus fusca, which when you look closely, you can really see how this leaf looks very appleish. And of course, the flower looks very appleish. It's a multi stem tree. It likes it reasonably moist. Um, and as such, being a multi stem tree, it'll be a very good bank stabilizer, especially if it's a, if you're close to a creek where it can get sufficient moisture. Um, when you, I don't have a picture of the actual fruit, but when you see the actual fruit, it does look indeed apple-like, and it was used by the indigenous groups along this coast to as preserve for the winter. When you cut it in half, it looks exactly like an apple with the apple core and whatnot. So a good bank stabilizer, not particularly attractive as a garden plant, but it certainly has its uses in, in what you might need in your environment. Similarly, the nine bark um, is an excellent for erosion control at a stream bank or in moist areas, but not necessarily terribly moist. But, um, but it grows to be fairly tall, anywhere from a meter and a half to four meters, and very dense forms very dense thickets. So if you want to, uh, if you're not worried about walking through it or whatnot at a stream bank that you want to stabilize, or if you want to have a windbreak, then that's an excellent plant to consider. Um, it has a shedding bark very similar to what I showed you in the Arbutus and hence the word nine bark. The flower looks very similar to the red osier dogwood if you remember, but you can see how different the leaves look. But as I say, as it's an attractive plant and very useful for erosion control. If you want a plant that's very early in the spring and also good as a as a bank plant or, or sheltered plant, then think of Omlaria. Uh, the books still call it Indian plum, but I prefer the word Omlaria. Um, if you think of driving along the highway and there's a moist area stream bank, the very, very first thing that comes out in the spring, or oftentimes already at the end of February, in terms of nice green leaves, that's the Omlaria. And uh, early in the spring, you'll see these white flowers coming out of it. Um, it forms a bit of a thicket, as you can see here. And later in the season, around about June, it will have clusters of berries like that. Um, doesn't have to have it terribly moist, but it thrives better if it is moist and a little bit shady. But again, excellent for erosion control. More in the edible things, I already referred to the thimbleberry earlier. Um, it's a beautiful plant. There's actually a cultivated thimbleberry that has uh, purple flowers, but here you see it with the uh, white flowers that are oh, roughly um, four centimeters, maybe even a bit taller, bigger in diameter. Very soft, graceful foliage gets to be oh anywhere from a meter fifty to two meters tall. So you have the beautiful foliage, white flowers, oftentimes in profusion, and then of course you have wonderful edible berries, uh, very much looking like a raspberry, tasting only like a thimbleberry, but 
you can tell it's in the raspberry family. So that is certainly a bush well worth having. And of course, it's attractive first to pollinators and then very much to all kinds of wildlife. And the foliage being so nice and soft is also somewhat attractive to wildlife. Very closely related to the thimbleberry is the salmonberry. I'm sure you all know the salmonberry. Beautiful flowers of this pink coloration um, early, early in the spring, likes it fairly moist. So that's why I put it into the wetland category. It can survive in somewhat drier conditions, but the moist and somewhat shady is the primary habitat for salmon berries. So you get the flower in the spring and then you get lovely golden berries in, oh, about June, yeah, about June. Um, you, there's actually two types of salmon berries. I can't distinguish them by the flower. I can only distinguish them by the color of their wonderful berries. Here you see the yellow berry that are like a very large raspberry uh, of equal size, equal shininess and beautiful is a truly red salmon color, like a sockeye salmon color uh, red berry. Equally tasty, lovely for birds, and lovely for us of making all kinds of uh, desserts or best eaten raw just as they are. And as the very last um, plant in this category is the skunk cabbage. These lovely swamp lanterns, I prefer swamp lantern over skunk cabbage as a name because I don't think anybody should, uh, any plant should be, um, put down by its name, but early, early in the spring, you get these beautiful yellow, about, oh, a meter tall flowers. Here's the actual flowers. Um, and then you get the shiny two meters or more leaves that appear later in the summer. And then and then they die back and next season they come out again and make springtime a real joy, especially along the moist environment. Um, interesting too, especially if you want to teach kids about pollen, if you have a windy day or if you go down to a swamp like that and you tap the stem a little, the amount of pollen that comes forth from the flowers is just amazing. Um, the bears also really like the, the um, swamp lantern skunk cabbage because they um, really aid the digestion. And story has it that when the bears first come out of hibernation, they look for the roots of skunk cabbage, dig them out, eat them, and then that stimulates their digestive system after they've had the long hibernation of not eating anything. I wouldn't recommend that, but it makes for a nice story. And that was the last plant that I wanted to share with you. Um, I do want to show you the information sources, which I think you've got in your handout. It's a very good book if you want to know more about gardening with native plants by Kirkeberg and Chalker Scott. My favorite one in terms of the local environment is from the Habitat Acquisition Trust in Victoria. You can Google that. And I already referred to the Pojar and McKinnon book if you want to know more details about individual plants, well worth having. And then there's a, a few websites about wildflowers in the Nanaimo area and on Vancouver Island in general. Um, and then the sources handout. And with that, I am done. And Kendra, I think, will um, go to the questions. Yes, thanks, Dorothy. That was terrific. All right, we have a lot of comments and questions. Uh, first uh, question just about this recording. And I meant to tell you that, yes, this, this uh, workshop will be recorded and available on our website under the Read, Watch, Listen tab under Virtual Programs portal so we can you can look back at your specific uh, area related to what you have in your own garden and and watch it again tell your friends and families to watch the workshop okay and then we had a comment about uh, that there are some native penstemons uh, the fruticocus and scularii um, they are native to bc and very attractive to pollinators is that right dorothy Oh, absolutely. In fact, not too long ago, I heard a marvelous lecture on um, the paintbrush and also penstemon both. And 
it, as I said earlier, there's so many wonderful plants that would be very suitable in a home garden, and I don't have time for all of them. But the real reason is when I was preparing this talk, I couldn't walk as far as where I could find any of either type. I had hoped to get up to uh, the Mount Washington um, Paradise Meadows area and take some pictures so I could show you and tell you about those plants because they are so good in the gardens, but it wasn't there. And, and one of our uh, participants was wondering if the deer eat the native penstemons. Do you know? I can't say one way or the other. Um, because I haven't really had them in a garden that I've seen. Um, I would imagine that they are somewhat deer resistant. I have a related variety in my garden, not, yeah, related variety. And the deer browse on it a little bit, but not too bad. Okay, great. And uh, we were speaking about um, good places to buy native plants. And somebody mentioned that the Swan Lake Nature Center used to sell native plants, so they still might. I, I sort of, I did a quick Google of that and I wonder if they mean the Swan Lake Christmas Hill Nature Sanctuary in Victoria. That sounds like a wonderful place to go and see some rare and endangered native plants. Do you know much about that one, Dorothy? I know it's there. Um, the friends of mine have pointed it out and I know they used to sell uh, native plants, but I don't know what the current status is. So I can't answer it directly, but if you're living in the Victoria area and I'm sure you can Google it, then you can get a much better impression of, of where they are in the scheme of things. But it certainly is well worth exploring. Yes, it sounds wonderful. Just a, it sounds like a, an extensive array of native plants and uh, wild animals and creatures anyway. So good to visit whether they sell native plants still or not. Uh, and the next question was how invasive is Salal, if at all? Um, like do there, do the, does the rhizome spread and sort of take over? The rhizomes do spread, that's how they kind of pop up, but they form fairly dense clusters. I personally would not be at all concerned about not being able to keep it in check. The only plant that I can think of in terms of what I mentioned is the bleeding heart. It tends to get a little bit out of control, as I mentioned, or you can keep it in check, but you have to work at it a little bit. But with the Salal, I wouldn't worry about that at all. Okay, great. And I know you uh, advise um, against transplanting any native plants, rather getting the seeds, but somebody was asking whether the erith erythronium is hard to transplant if you were to do so. It comes from bulbs. And so relatively speaking, erythronium is one of the easiest ones to do. Well, any of the ones that come from bulbs, whether you're talking erythronium or camas or the, the chocolate lily, those are all relatively easy. But as I say, I personally am very against harvesting from the wild um, because you do do so much, potentially do do so much damage to the natural environment. Probably your success with the bulbs is going to be fairly high um, in terms of transplanting it, assuming that you can give it the right environment but it's just not a very good thing to do for nature in general. Okay, great. And then a question about the trillium. Um, uh, um, someone in the audience had said that they always thought that the two different colors, the purple and the white were two different varieties, but are there any other varieties or is there just that one variety that changes color? Um, there's many different trillium varieties, but in our area here, the trillium ovatum is the native species and the others are not native to here. I can't speak to the changing of colors in the species that aren't native here, but it's a very common misconception that there's two different varieties when in fact it's one variety and not every single plant will change color, but many, many do. And you could put a stake or a little marker or something by a trillium that you see in the environment, next year that is, because they bloom in, in the spring, um, put a little marker there and see whether I'm correct or not, but I'm fairly sure I am correct. Great, okay, that's really interesting. Uh, and then a comment about um, that wild ginger is actually pollinated by ground beetles. 
I have heard that. I wouldn't be surprised. And it's it's to me one of those species that's truly interesting. I mean, in, as I mentioned in my friend Chris's garden, it is just so fantastic and it spreads out and spreads out and I can't make it grow for anything. Um, but I know several places in the wild and it is so amazing to me how specific it is in, in the um, Englishman River watershed. There's in the park end of things, there's two spots and two spots only that I'm aware of and nothing else in an environment that looks totally the same to me as an outsider. And uh, so it not only needs the ground beetles to move things along, um, but also it needs just the right environment. Okay. Interesting. And um, speaking of, of um, plants that um, are moved along by various insects. The trillium seeds I've heard are actually moved around by ants. Oh, neat. All right. The next question was, uh, are bunch berries edible? Yes, they are. Boring, but edible. Nice. Okay. Bland, but... Bland, but edible. The Great. same, I, very few of the plants I've mentioned are toxic. The, um, the bleeding heart being one of the exceptions, but the berries of course, salal is, is delicious. Red huckleberry is delicious. Um, the bear berry falls into the bunch berry category, perfectly edible, but has a big seed in it and is terribly bland. I'm trying to think of what other berries I mentioned, uh -huh. but anyway, so um, yeah, you yeah. can eat the bunch uh -huh. berry, looks lovely, but not worth it. And uh, Oregon grape berry as well? Yes, definitely. Makes nice jelly, nice tart jelly. Okay. Um, and then somebody asked a question about, do you have any more recommendations for grasses for sunny or rocky areas? I don't have recommendations for grasses. And, uh, and I would just look to see what the nurseries can offer you in terms of tall grasses, short grasses, and then that sort of thing. But uh, I can't answer that because I haven't really researched it enough. Okay, great. And then just a really nice comment about um, suggesting a book, Gardening with Native Plants is a wonderful reference book, but I just wish that they had organized the plants uh, the same way you did by environment. So nice compliment. <laughs> the way you work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but it is a good reference book. No, no matter what. Okay. You know that one too. Yeah. Uh, oh, one more just came in. In the handout I read this morning, it mentioned mock orange trees. Oh, uh, wonderful suggestion. I should have included that. But as I say, I couldn't yeah. possibly include everything. But yeah, the Philadelphia is such a gorgeous shrub, grows in fairly hard, harsh environments, blooms profusely, wonderfully fragrant. Yeah, if, if I give this lecture again anywhere, I will definitely have to include the native mock orange. It's a wonderful suggestion. Oh, good. Does, do the flowers smell like orange? Do you know? I, I'm not sufficiently versed with orange flowers, but they sure smell good. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. All right. Well, I'm glad. Thank you for asking that question. Whoever asked that right at the end. All right, thank you so much, Dorothy. It was a super informative talk.